Liberty Maritime has been active in the carriage of PL-480 cargoes since 1988 and has successfully delivered almost 30 million tons on over 500 voyages to needy people all over the world during the last 27 years. We are proud of the historic accomplishments of the PL-480 program and of the critical role of the U.S. Merchant Marine and the role it's played since 1954 in delivering food and supporting this important program. You've already heard from other witnesses about how important the carriage of food aid is to the Merchant Marine, as it comprises an essential cargo so source for U.S. flag vessels. I would like to add from my long experience in this industry that the current situation is unprecedented in its level of devastation to the U.S. flag Merchant Marine. The U.S. flag fleet is suffering economically from an enormous decline in available cargoes, not to mention the MAP-21 reduction from 75% to 50% carriage, and many ships, including several of our own, have had to reflag with the resulting substantial loss of sea lift capacity and maritime jobs. So I can say without reservation that the current food aid preference cargo reservation uh, base is already inadequate to support the existing fleet and that new and substantial support is needed to prevent further deterioration in the fleet size and loss of sea lift capabilities needed for the future. Let me add something about U.S. flag rates which have been criticized by out-of-touch academics. What these critics forget first and foremost is U.S. flag carriers are rate capped by the U.S. government in its determination of what is a fair and reasonable rate. So we cannot charge more than an average of our costs, plus a modest regulated profit on any particular voyage. And because of a lack of cargoes and vigorous competition amongst U.S. flag ocean carriers, we never come close to hitting the regulated profit amount or ceiling. I would like to say a few words about the Obama administration proposals to dismantle PL-480 in the name of reform. As well intended as these proposals may be, they have already done substantial harm to PL-480 and will do irreversible damage if adopted by Congress. The proposals have put the public narrative on PL-480's imperfections rather than recognizing the program's enormously impressive track record and seeking to improve on it. In fact, it's hard to find another U.S. government program that has achieved so much for so long with so little. I dare say that if other foreign assistance programs were anything like the PL-480 program, the American people would actually like foreign aid. Much of the funding is spent in the U.S. to buy U.S. agricultural products, to mill them here, send them to ports via rails, barges, and trucks, and ship them on U.S. flag vessels, which are then delivered by U.S.-based private voluntary organizations. And most importantly, the program delivers assistance to persons who need it in a transparent, accountable, and efficient way. I would ask the members of the two committees represented here today whether we will be able to say that if PL-480 becomes a cash giveaway program. Will the American people support a giveaway program of cash that inevitably will be neither transparent nor accountable? I don't think we need any polling done to know the answer to that question. We strongly urge caution and prudence before dismantling a program that has worked so well for so long and won't be easy to reconstitute if it turns out that cash and vouchers are the wrong way to go. We already are the leading provider of cash aid in the world. We need do no more. Indeed, we believe the evidence is already accumulating that shows that cash and vouchers lead, as one would expect intuitively, to enormous diversions of funds, fraud, waste, and abuse. I commend the subcommittee to the November 2014 United Nations Inspector General Report and to the 2015 GAO reports, both of which indicate that cash voucher programs are rife with fraud and abuse and lack transparency and accountability. One of my favorite vignettes from those reports is the admission by GAO that the only verification that vouchers are ending up in the right hands to be used for the right purposes has been by satellite surveillance. I urge the subcommittees to contemplate how likely is it that sporadic satellite surveillance can prevent voucher fraud and abuse in Africa. From my own company's long experience, I can tell you that when we're hired to deliver food, not only to a foreign country, but also directly to a refugee camp, that food gets there every time. 
We take that obligation seriously, and shipping contracts make it our responsibility. The food gets delivered to the dock or to the inland refugee camp, whatever is called for in the contract. Let me add that the President's proposal to transfer 25 percent or um, more of PL 480 funding to be used for further cash giveaways tied to a one-time payment to carriers is unacceptable. It would hasten the dismantling of the PL 480 program in exchange for a token gesture. The U.S. Merchant Marine needs sustained support, not a severance payment. I respectfully urge that instead of destroying PL 480, Congress should consider ways to improve purchasing, the purchasing, transportation, and distribution of in-kind food aid. We would be pleased to offer suggestions, as I'm sure other carriers and program participants would as well. Most of the available ideas are not new. They've been proposed by GAO and others over the years and ignored by shipper agencies, especially AID. For example, the way shipper agencies contract for transportation services unnecessarily costs the U.S. government money. In the commercial sector, contracts tend to apportion risk and responsibility to the person in the transportation ch chain that has the most control and can mitigate the risk. So, for example, where the ocean carrier does not control the ocean terminal, the terminal is responsible for loading or discharge delays caused by its employees or actions, not the ocean carrier. Yet, ironically, the U.S. government ignores this commercial sensibility in favor of putting all the risk and responsibility on the ocean carrier, even for things totally out of its control. The inevitable result is the ocean carrier rates are higher than they have to be to account for this risk. From the adoption of commercial terms to incorporating priority berthing on load and discharge ports, these are just two of many contracting practices that would increase efficiency and lower costs. There are other, many other examples of ideas that could improve efficiency. We hope that we can continue to work with the Agriculture and Transportation and Infrastructure Committees to have those ideas reviewed and vetted for possible changes to the law. First and foremost, we need to reinstate the 75 percent carriage requirement that, in effect, that was in effect for the last 25 years until the MAP 21 legislation three years ago. Mm 